Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Carstensen, Editor-in-Chief of Dental Sleep Practice Magazine. I want to welcome you to this webinar today about uh, pulse oximetry using the non-in uh, machine and Dr. Ron Prynne, our expert speaker for today. It's estimated that OSA affects 25, 30, who knows how many millions of our patients, our colleagues, our, our circles. And we dentists have a big role to play in getting them helped. We need some ability to match our physician colleagues and understand how to assess our patients for the problem and how to assess how we're doing as we help participate in the therapy. The non-impulse oximetry, is, as you will see, will be very helpful for finding out how this can work. I'm excited to introduce my friend, Dr. Ron Pran. I've known him a long time. He's one of our experts in uh, the use of pulse oximetry in practice because he's been focusing on nothing but sleep and TMD therapy in Texas for quite a while. He's got a medical dental practice focusing oral, on oral appliance therapy and cooperating with CPAP therapy for helping patients who sleep poorly or have trouble with their TMJ uh, uh, for a long time. He's authored a number of articles in our industry. He's a frequent writer. I've enjoyed his writings for Dental Sleep Practice Magazine. He spent a great deal of time keeping up with the latest learning in medicine and dentistry about this whole subject. He's well qualified, as he can tell you about, from many organizations and lots of training. So without any further uh, delay, let's listen to Ron Prynne tell us about how we can use oximetry to help our sleep patients become healthier uh, people in our communities. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Ronald Prane. I practice in the Woodlands, Texas, which is just north of Houston. I've limited my practice in doing only TMJ about 25 years ago, and that, that also included dental sleep medicine and, and about 15 years ago, full time. I graduated in 1981 from Marquette School of Dentistry, and in between the graduation and limiting my practice, I went through the Pankey Institute. I did a facial pain residency program at the uh, University of Florida. I have been doing oral appliances full time for the last 25 years, and I have been using the uh, pulse oximetry to titrate my oral appliances for sleep for the last 15 years. Nanan has asked me to share some of my uh, ideas for titrating or appliances with pulse oximetry uh, since that is uh, the best way of finding objective data about how it's going. Thus, the name of this presentation is how to use pulse oximetry in oral appliance therapy for the treatment of sleep disorder breathing. Uh, just a couple quick disclosures. Uh, yes, not in this sponsoring this presentation. Um, I have received compensation for this uh, presentation, but I do not represent NANAN in any way. I don't work for them, and my views may not be their views. Um, the information provided is based on my experience, and I also do a lot of research, and uh, I also uh, read a lot. So uh, I also included some of that, those facts in this presentation. I do own several devices, more like 10, 11, or 12, uh, and I have purchased them all. So let's start with a quick overview first of sleep testing. Uh, there are basically four types. Uh, type 1 and type 2 are done by the physician, uh, either in the lab or they all take the equipment to a home. The type that we are interested in in this particular presentation is type 3 and type 4, especially type 4. Type 3 are the um, expensive devices. They are the ones that uh, and a physician can use them to actually diagnose. They, they measure four different biomarkers um, uh, then, but they can be used for titration for mandibular uh, or appliances, but they are expensive and uh, disposables can be very expensive. These are uh, several examples of those types. Uh, there's the watch pad, the Brabon, the Ares, and the uh, apnea link, and many, many others. Um, the other type, type four, uh, sleep studies, these are the ones that will record at least two variables, two biomarkers. These cannot be used for diagnosis by anybody, but they make really great screening devices for um, our devices. They usually measure um, oxygen desaturations and they also measure heart rate, in particular for our case, heart rate variability, which I'll get to more in a moment. 
The device that is a very excellent device for this type of sleep study is the Nanon 3150. Um, it's on the, worn on the wrist, and it has a finger sensor that is clipped to the front. Not clipped, it just the finger goes into the tip there. I'll get more into that in a minute. But let's start with the diagnosis, which is done by a physician. What he uses is two aspects. One is subjective, which is the symptoms the patient has. It's the what are you, why are you here for, and how do you feel, and, uh, and they use history and they use questionnaires. Then there's the objective aspect of the diagnosis, which is the sleep testing. These are the signs, and you can't take a picture like an x-ray and say you've got sleep apnea. It's a dynamic process that goes on all night. These are the same two aspects that we're going to be using in our titration of the sleep. So the subjective, like I said, is sleep history, questionnaires, there's many different types. And what what is the patient's main complaint? See, you need to know this if you're going to treat this particular disorder. A physician will get it for themselves, but then when our patient becomes our patient, we need to track these things as well. The objecting uh, the, the objective Studies are done by the physician. He can either do it for an in-lab study, type 1, or he can use home testing too, uh, but that's up to him. And when he, he does a diagnosis, you will get a, a report. And this is a typical report that I will get from my sleep physician. And it shows everything I need to know objectively. This subjective, I'm going to have to get myself. And so I would do the, I would do the, uh, the history and the, um, the upward sleepiness scales and things like that. But look at this report, because what you need to know from this is, but you're going to be using this for tracking your titration for your oral appliance. The AHI and the RDI, the apneic index and the uh, respiratory disturbance index, uh, you can see on this patient it's about 34. Mark it down your chart. That's what you need to know. Of particular importance, and this isn't always on the test, and you may have to get this from your physician, is the ODI, the Oxygen Desaturation Index, because that's what we're going to be measuring with pulse oximetry. This particular patient is 24. Notice that they mark a desaturation event as a desaturation that goes 3% drop in blood oxygen. Our our pulse oximeter devices that we use, especially the non and is easy to adjust. I will measure a, an event as a 2% drop in oxygen desaturation. Uh, but that's part of the adjustment of the device. Once you get it, you can set all that yourself. Then the PSO2, of course, is the low oxygen uh, level that the patient gets to. You can see this patient is 67%. These go on the chart, and this is what you're going to be tracking uh, during your, your um, therapy. A quick word about... Uh, the difference between obstructive sleep apnea and upper airway because this affects how we use the device itself. So basically the airway collapses at night, or it starts to collapse, and the brain picks up on this changes and pressures in the throat, and it will put forth effort to protect itself, to protect the airway. Uh, one of them uh, is clenching, of course, that advances the tongue and opens the airway. Another one is to expand the chest, toss or turn, do whatever the body can, it's going to protect that airway. Well, this, these cannot be done in the deep sleep, so the patient has an arousal to the lighter stages of sleep in order to put forth this effort. These are measured by a sleep study as effort-related arousals, RERAs. Now, if these RERAs, despite the best effort, the patient starts to desaturate, the oxygen goes down, then that is called obstructive sleep apnea. In other words, the effort's failing. It's not protecting the area anymore. Sometimes, oftentimes, most of the time, this effort actually works. Those arousals cause fragmented sleep because the patient's arousing all night long. The airway opens up, there's no apnea, but they do have upper airway because the fragmented sleep is what's causing all the symptoms the patient has. Either TMJ from clenching, they have headaches, they have other medical issues, I had blood pressure, blood sugar problems, drowsiness. Those are all tied to fragmented sleep, not necessarily oxygen desaturation. So this is important to know because we'll be using the pulse oximeter in two different ways here once this is established on the patient's diagnosis. So how about the oral appliance itself? It moves the jaw forward, right? Pretty straightforward. Well, 
as you move the jaw forward more, the therapy becomes more effective. That is fantastic. Let's go as far as we can. No, that's not. Because if you move too far, the more forward you move the jaw, the more side effects the patient can have. So you're only going to want to move the jaw forward to the level that is effective and the patient's symptoms are resolved and the testing is normal. Because the side effects are, you know, moving T, TMJ and things like that. So you want to avoid the side effects by only moving them forward as little as possible. So again, we're going to measure the same thing we did on the testing, the subjective. How do you feel? We're tracking the original symptoms. Fatigue is the most common subjective complaint people have. Ask them questions and see how they're doing. Give them a test, the upper sleepiness scale. I'll show you a couple here that I use. Objectives, how do you do objective? Pulse oximetry is the great way of doing it. You get your blood oxygen levels, your heart rate variability, which I'll explain what's so important about the heart rate, and then you get a number of ROSI events. You get all that from pulse oximetry. You don't need to send them back to a sleep physician at this point because that's a wasted trip if they're not working. If the objective testing is still deficient, then we need to keep moving forward. So the pulse oximeter that I look for, I've had some many, many, many through the years. I've gone through many different types. And this is my advice when you look for a pulse oximeter. I like the ones made in the United States of America. All the ones I've had, those are the most those are the only ones I have left in my office right now. I would look for quality and reputation. Nanan has been around. In fact, they're the ones who develop pulse oximetry. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, they have a good history. They have great customer support that people speak English. Well, kind of. You know, they have those Minnesota accents, don't you know? But they're easy to understand. Nice people once you get to know them. Just kidding. They're very patient-friendly. They're easy to use. They're very comfortable. Uh, there's not doesn't take much instructions. You, you plug the sensor in. It turns on. You unplug it. It turns off. Simple. You can do it several nights in a row. And, and when you take it off, the battery shuts down the machine and you plug it back in, it starts it up again. It's easy to read the reports. You can adjust those yourself. Uh, the staff just prints it out, puts it on my desk with my questionnaire, and I can make decisions. Disposable is very inexpensive. Now on here are these pictures right here you see. The rubber ones are the ones I use for 99% of the time. But what's great about the non-ins, you can also attach those paper ones that you show that that's taped on the end of the finger, just like you would if you're in an emergency room. And so that is something for people who, who toss and turn a lot at night, and they're moving their arms around. It keeps it on them. Then, of course, my staff can easily to administer this whole program. The 3150 is the, their current uh, uh, device, and I uh, highly recommend it because, for me, it, it meets all those standards that I was just talking about. Okay, so let's get down nitty gritty here. The object, subjective findings I get by using this questionnaire. Patients' global impression of change of scale. They just mark off how they feel about the treatment so far. And then the upward sleepiness scale is something we had started from the very beginning and we're going to track that. Uh, we want to basically be under five if we can. Now, objective. That's where pulse oximetry comes in. This is a sample of a pulse oximetry I did on a mandibular basement splint. It was their first titration. In other words, a patient had already started feeling pretty good, and we wanted to see where we're at. And so I would look at the study here. Uh, the main thing I look at, number one first, is how much time below 90% this patient was all night long. I want to be less than 1%. This patient had 9.2% of the night they're under 90% oxygen in their blood. They also had a minimum uh, blood oxygen level of 85, not acceptable, I want to be above 90. And they also had 40 arousals an hour still going on. So you can look at the graph down below, the oxygen graph. You can see all the times it went below 90. These are kind of around 90% all night long. Look at the heart rate, that's called variable when it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. You can kind of almost see in this chart, uh, in this uh, graph here with the heart rate variability, where it really gets wild there, and then it calms down. Then it gets wild again. That usually represents a REM cycle. 
Why? Because during REM cycle, the muscles relax, they shut down, and the support of breathing starts to decline, and the patient goes into more and more uh, panic and effort to maintain the airway. Okay, so I titrate the uh, appliance back forward and add them back and did another pulse oximetry. Look at that. They're above 90% all night long. If you look on the right side, right hand side there, perfect. Minimum oxygen 85, well that doesn't make sense, so you just kind of look at the graph and there may have been one spike, like when they, they shifted on their fingers, so I just crossed that out. And look on the graph, you can see they're above 90% all night long. And then index of 11. Their heart rate looks like it's variable, but it's not like it was on the other chart. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more calmness than that. So in this particular patient, if they said I still got some fatigue, I may advance them just based on the heart rate variability alone. Because heart rate variability will tell me effort. Because when the, the, the airway starts to close down, the brain will, will increase the sympathetic activity to, to protect it, and that shows up in heart rate variability. So interpretation is based, again, on the context of if they have a structural sleep apnea or not. OSA, I would, I would titrate my oral appliances based on the symptom and simple pulse oximetry. Time under 90%. I want them less than 1% of the time. Number two, upper airway people, they don't desat, remember? Their oxygen stays good all night. That's working. Their effort's working. So I'm trying to pick up on the effort, and that's where the heart rate variability comes in. It suggests effort. It doesn't, it's not, it's not correlated by research yet. I hope to one of these days. But that's just an indicator. Put that together with the symptoms, and you can determine if you need to advance the mandible. So we, after the um, study has been done, the, the assistant prints it out, and I've got the Epworth. They fill in three quarters of this worksheet. This worksheet is a fantastic worksheet to use. It, it gives you everything you need to make a decision of what this pulse oximeter is doing for you. And so you have the, you have the original PSG with all the variables. Then see where it says HST date, all right? Then there's two nights, and I put down both nights. Because the second, I, I only do two nights in a row, and the batteries will, will, will last easily for four nights, but I want two nights for, and, um, uh, for several reasons. And then you can determine based on that and the symptoms, because she's going to put down, your assistant's going to put down these things. Where we're at, why we're taking the test, what decision needs to be made by you at the, with this test. You will make comments like, too much time under 90%, heart rate still variable, then your recommendations based on this is to do these several things at the bottom here. You want to advance, redo it, time go to the physician, maybe think about combination therapy, it's just not working as far as it can go. And those decisions are made by you based on these um, uh, the testing. Quick legal perspective on how this pulse act works for you. Remember, the physician can legally make the proper diagnosis, and we can legally fabricate the oral appliances. So this is the protocol that is pretty much goes in line with the clinical guidelines uh, by the ASM. Patient has no sleep study. You would do history and examination. Any signs and symptoms of sleep dis um, disturbances, send them to a physician and get a sleep study. If there's no other signs, I just snore or I just clench, but everything else is good, I would do a screening maybe a type 3 at that point, and send them over uh, results over to the physician who can then say, yes, bring them in, or no, you can go ahead and treat without a sleep study. Once the physician makes that determination, then they come back and they're good to go for our oral appliance. Then I will use the pulse oximetry to titrate it and send the patient and the studies back to the physician for final determination. Now, if the patient's already had a sleep study, then you just do your dental examination and move forward to the appliance and titrate with pulse oximetry. Then after the titration is done, send all the pulse ox reports and um, all your subjective findings for the final PSG done by the sleep physician. So in summary, working with a sleep physician, their responsibility is to diagnose and their responsibility is to determine final effectiveness of the therapy. Which they are looking at the disease called obstructive sleep apnea. 
the dentist's responsibility is determined if the oral appliance is effective for airway patency. That's our job. So therefore, we will do that with objective and subjective uh, findings. And once we know the airway is patent, we send them back to the physician for a final determination of the disease of, of, of obstructive sleep apnea. Communication with physician is essential. I would establish a written standard operating procedure, how your testing is going to work and how he wants to see it, well, how you, everything works, and once you get that, you have a great communication with the sleep physician. Now, I put this in here. This is a great study uh, about what physicians think about oral appliance treatment. Uh, this is a hundred um, uh, survey done by a hundred uh, physicians. Their main concern out of a hundred physicians, sixty-seven, so they're concerned about efficacy of treatment. If that's their main concern, what a great boost to that communication! and a report by a pulse oximeter. That has established me as one of their top referrals because they know that I will test with pulse oximetry and that gives them the information they need to know that the treatment is being effective. In summary, summary, I promise this is the last summary. It is important to develop a relationship with a sleep physician and if possible board of sleep physician. You need that relationship in order to treat these, patient, these patients. Set up a protocol. Like I said, um, put it in writing. You both sign it and go back and forth and he needs to return the information that you need in order to treat as well. Titrate with subjective with the questionnaires and objective with pulse oximetry. Communicate effectively and you will be treating patients uh, to a level that you never thought possible. So I want to thank Nanan for uh, promoting uh, this concept because it's going to raise the standard of care for our patients and for all the dentists who are treating patients with this sleep disorder breathing. I hope this lights the fire in you so you can go get more information. Uh, go to the Academy, American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, and uh, they have great courses. Uh, go to other dental schools and nonprofits and look for more information to learn as much. Find some sleep dentists in your area that will help you out. So thank you again, Nanan, for uh, um, the opportunity to share this information. Well, Ron, that was really great. Thanks a lot for that uh, comprehensive look at uh, using pulse oximetry. I got a couple of questions for you, though. I know that uh, you said that you know, you're using that and then you're sending the uh, uh, patient back to the sleep doc with the results of the oximetry. Sleep docs use a lot of home sleep testers. Do they use pulse oximeters also? Um, yes, um, pulse oximetry is on all home testing. Also, they also use uh, pulse oximetry when they're in lab tests. They actually, 90% of in lab tests use a non in technology. Uh, so when they get a report from my non in um, uh, devices, they compare apples to apples with the testing that they did in their lab. It's really nice. But, but you don't, so, so I, I, I saw the comparison of the home sleep as the type 3 monitors versus the type 4 monitors. Can you talk a little bit more about why you choose to use the type 4 monitor to check your efficacy of your appliances instead of using a type 3 monitor all the time? Yeah, that's a good question, Steve, because when I first got into this, I'm a dentist and I love gadgets, and I bought a bunch of type 3 monitors. Very expensive. They're like several thousands of dollars each. Disposables can be it can range from a few dollars to $85 each test, and I really wasn't getting anything more from them that I would from the pulse oximetry part of those devices. And so about, yeah, about 10 years ago, I decided let's, let's do pulse oximetry. I had pulse oximeters in my practice, but when I started doing pulse oximetry alone, I got as much information that I had from the type 3 devices. So it really wasn't, it was basically a financial decision. Because sometimes I'll do like three, four, five titrations on a single patient. Uh, that can be very expensive for those other devices. So that's, that's why I type 4 devices. I know just what you're talking about in my practice, the type 3 devices, that always also takes a lot more staff time to get set up and yes. explaining it and looking it over, those kind of things. 
Yeah, there's more leads. There's a lot more leads, and they don't get on right, and they slip off during the night, and, and the patient doesn't get the t we don't get the test we get. This wrist pulse oximeter is so simple. I, I hardly, rarely ever get one come back where it was done wrong. It's it's all it's really simple for the patient to use. Do you send those results with, of the oximetry also over to the sleep physician? Do they pay much attention to that? Or do you find your patients doing a, a repeat HST, or how does that work for your uh, practice? The way it works for me is that I have several sleep physicians I work with. Some of them want one each time I take it. I'll, I'll fax it over there. Um, most of my sleep physicians want them all at the end when I send them back for the final HST. They will do a either a final HST or a final PSG, depends on how much comorbid conditions are going on. Uh, but that's their determination. But they do like to see these, uh, the titration results, because their concern is about efficacy of the oral device, and this pretty much proves it, and that's that they like that. Okay. You know, we, uh, we, I know this is going to come up. Uh, so uh, do you get paid for these pulse oximetry tests? You mentioned doing multiples of them. You know, could that get kind of pricey for the patient if you charge for this? Uh, it could. I don't charge. I pretty much include, once you buy the device, there are basically zero more dollars spent on this this uh, protocol. So I don't really uh, charge the patient to do these titrations at all. Um, there may be insurance codes, but they are mostly for physicians to charge out than dentists. I just keep it simple. Just buy the device and use it for another 15 years. You'll definitely get your money's worth. Well, you did mention that because you're using this and, and doing a subjective testing that the uh, physicians that you work with are, are much happier to work with you about that. So that's got to be, you know, overall cost effective, doesn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. And uh, the relationship, building relationships, but I guess I feel good that I know before I send the patient over that our device is working. It's it's doing what's supposed to be doing. Before I did this, I'd send patients over to come back. Uh, your, your oxygen's still going down. You need to titrate further. And that poor patient just made a trip, took a night out of their life to go back and find out that my device isn't effective. Now they don't go back to the physician unless we know that the device is effective. And it's okay. it's been a great boost for every. I know there's no downside to this at all. You know, one of the things I'd like for you to ask a little bit more questions about is you mentioned using the uh, pulse rate variability, and that's a little uh, not quite research supported yet, but if you're using it as a good indicator, and there's certainly a lot of talk out there about um, pulse oximetry and using high resolution oximetry versus whatever the, whatever not high resolution. I, I've kind of thought they all high resolution. Can you say something about that, please? Yeah, uh, these are all high resolution, and the heart rate variability, you cannot look at that if the patient has a pacemaker, if they're on certain medications that affect heart rate, um, uh, MIOs and things like that. And so, but that's very rare. I use, I use very heart rate variability based on the research that is out there concerning the sympathetic nervous system and activation of the sympathetic nervous system at night. There is research for that. And when a patient starts to have a drop in esophageal pressure because there's airway starting to close down, there is an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which reflects itself in the increase in heart rate, you know, the fight or flight response. And so that's, that's what I use. You're right, there's no research that correlates uh, exactly heart rate variability and symptoms, uh, hoping that will be coming up soon. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's how I use it. But again, you gotta be, you gotta always correlate to subjective symptoms, you know. The heart rate variability is not the end all, like this is everything's good when heart rate's calm, because you still got the symptoms, they both go together. Which kind of brings up a question that came in from our audience, and they said, well, gosh, if their symptoms are resolved, and they're feeling good, and you go home with a pulse oximetry from uh, your office, and it comes back all positive, well, why should they go back to the sleep doc? I mean, didn't you just say it's all good at that point and they're feeling good? So do you have to, tell me how you deal with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh. I get when I, I get that in my lectures all the time, and I, I think there's several reasons. Um, one is uh, building a relationship with a physician is always a good thing because we do work together. There are patients who are really sick, and we don't want to be responsible for them. Number one. Number two is. 
while they may be feeling good and everything looks good on a pulse ox, they may be having other sleep symptoms like central apneas that are unresolved. They may be having partial seizures at night. There's other things that can cause fatigue. Like let's just say don't take enough vitamin D. Okay, they're tired still off and on and they get in a car wreck. Well, I don't want to be responsible for the one to say that, yes, your apnea is resolved based on my testing. I want the physician to be liable for their actions after that. And then the third one is, and um, it's just good medicine to have a physician worry about the disease of sleep apnea. That's beyond the scope of dentistry. It's a cardiovascular event. It's, it's, a, it's a cerebral vascular event. It's a pulmonary event. It's the what we do, we are concerned with the airway. We want to make the airway open. We can do that. That's our job. It's their job to look at all the other medical comorbidities and things. And so kind of like that, then, if you're going to see the patient on an ongoing basis, another question came in, we can use this on an annual basis, too, to, to see how they're yes. doing, just kind of checking in. Absolutely. I see every one of my patients every year. And if there's any change in weight, any change in symptoms, um, sometimes I would just, it depends on where they were before, but I would do a pulse ox there too. I can also use them for screening for people that are in, not convinced they have this problem, and it's usually a husband. Like they'll come with their wife, I don't have any problems, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, just humor me. All right, take this pulse ox home and send it back, and we'll, we'll tell you what's going on. Oh, my gosh, this one guy came back, and he was a dentist, and he said, I've got no sleep problems, and and I did it. He, he went down to 75% oxygen at night. Huh. And I, upon further questioning, I said, do you have any like, really heart issues? No, I don't. Well, maybe I do. You know. And so you need to get this treated. And it, it, it really, you can use it for screening only, but uh, physicians don't really want us to do that because they're afraid dentists would diagnose. So we got to be careful never to use this as a diagnosis, but it can be for screening and in your general practice to get people to go into a uh, sleep study. One of the things you mentioned earlier was that people can advance their lower jaws too far and can influence uh, the airway staying open if they've stretched out extra far. Yeah. Can the oximetry be used to find that sweet spot or, or find yeah. out if somebody's gone too far? Uh, good question. I've never thought of that. Um, I would say I advanced until we get to that sweet spot with the symptoms and the objective is correlation. If I go too far, then I know we start getting more side effect symptoms, and that right. usually what tells me I've gone too far. You know, like that jaw pain and that kind of thing. Yeah, the teeth are moving. I have morning aligners. I always use that saved my my practice as far as I'm concerned. Um, all those side effects of the anterior teeth moving, they're pretty much gone with the morning aligner. But if they go too far, then then there's such a, a big gap between what they're supposed to be and where they are all night, I don't want to go too far. You know, and right. it's just there's too many things to deal with. You know, Ron, I'd love to hear another webinar with you and those side effects because I know about your expertise in that area, but that's not today's <laughs> subject. So no. uh, another thing is, is I, I know some dentists, and I'm, I'm really kind of intrigued by this too, is uh, helping... Uh, patients understand the concept of a mandibular advancement device by using a professional level temporary. So again, kind of, maybe I know the answer to this question, but beyond just the symptom resolution with a temporary oral device, can tell me, do you use a pulse oximetry to uh, check that efficacy as well? Yes, I will use a, uh, I call it proof of concept. Um, I'll, I'll make a temporary and I, I've, I can use these for two nights. So the first night I say, don't wear this. The second night, put this in your mouth. And when I teach um, oral appliances, I do this with my students. I have five of them I use. First night, don't wear it. Second night, put the temporary advancement in and wear it. And let's compare the two. You get to correlate you know, with and without, and that kind of proves the concept that this device is going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how many nights do you? You mentioned two nights. Do you ever go more than two nights with the uh, oximetry? And I know it can. The batteries can handle a couple nights, but what about data size, all that kind of stuff? Uh, the batteries can handle four nights. In fact, I had a patient just come back with five. And what we did with that patient, and and I've got, I have a lot of patients who live far away, so they want to make sure. And sometimes what they'll do is we'll get, have them advance a click a night click, 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 click forward, and then I'll 
then you can see, like, let's say on the, on the second night, looks pretty good. On the third night, looks pretty good. On the fourth night, looks pretty good. Well, then they've advanced too far. You know, like, you don't need to go up that many clicks. Go back to where you were on the second night. That seems to be the most effective spot. It's almost kind of like an in-lab titration. So I, I, have, I don't do that very often, but once in a while I'll, I will do that for the patient who has to travel here from a long distance away. And then I have them mail them back. Oh, and now okay. the way it works in my office, somebody I was going to, somebody usually asks you, how does it work? Well, the, the, the assistants have all the boxes labeled, one, two, three, four, five, and then they have like a library card that they keep track of every one. And when the patient sends it back, they plug it into the machine, into the computer, they get a printout, then they give me that titration sheet, and it's on my desk. I make the decision, give it back to the assistant, they call the patient and tell them what to do next. And so it's, it's I don't do much of the the day-to-day -day managing of these appliances, uh, these devices. Uh, the nonins are pretty um, self, they run themselves, and the, the assistants understand them very well, and it works very, it, it works very well. Okay, I, I got to ask, have you ever sent one out and not got it back? What do you do about that? Well, we run their credit card uh, before they leave, <laughs> and I've gotten everyone back. Okay. I, I, actually, I did have one that got lost in the mail. Um, yeah. I I just had to let that one go. Luckily, it's one of the 3100s. That, I have a couple of 3100 non-ins, too, because they just won't die. It's Those are like 15 years old. Oh but non -in still has parts for these things and still keeps them running. It's really nice. Okay, you know, it's easy to get excited about technology like this and go, wow, I, I need this for every patient because every patient's going to respond. Is there anybody we shouldn't use oximetry on for uh, this testing? I mean, is it somebody we should stay away from? Uh, yeah, people with pacemakers, um, but you can still use oximetry for those patients, just you can't use the heart rate variability. I, will, I can't imagine a case where I would not use it. Sometimes we even use it for combination therapy to see if the CPAP and the combination device is actually effective or not. Um, sometimes I'll even use it with the CPAP. The, pa the patient says, I'm on CPAP, I'm doing great. I said, hey, let's just put a pulse oximetry on you. It doesn't cost anything. See what look And oh my gosh, they're like desatting with the CPAP. And, and sometimes I'll do that. Why would I do that? Because they tell me I'm wearing a CPAP and I'm still tired. Well, let's see if the CPAP is working. And then I'll send them back for a new titration study or I'll go into combination therapy. Because so, the PAP devices know about flow because they got the cards, but they don't have oxygen in there, do they? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Sometimes if the patient has pulmonary issues that the CPAP doesn't, you know, all they're doing is titrating with pressures and stuff, and they, they need to have a supplemental oxygen. And I've used this not in to pick up on those type of patients that we've had to add oxygen to their CPAP machine. Physician just, just too busy to worry about it. So how do you do that? If you, if you discover all these things, and you've got a pretty good handle on that patient, but you think, wow, they need oxygen, you can't order oxygen, can you? I mean, that, that's well, a position, right? I can, but I don't. I mean, I have one time, uh, but really? most I just send them back to the physician. Yeah. Um, they, I want them to, to deal with that. Yeah, and if they, don't, if they don't have them, I'll send them to a pulmonologist, because a pulmonologist can work with CPAPs as well. Sure. But then we have to worry a little bit about central sleep apnea as if there's too much oxygen on board, that kind of thing. That's right. right. That's yeah. their judgment. We don't want to worry about that. All right. So we've got a couple minutes left. And so tell me, uh, uh, what's, what's a little clinical tip? So I've got one for you because you mentioned uh, the, the using the tapes on the fingers sometimes. Well, I just put the – I don't have but just the rubber ones, and I just tape the rubber ones down because, <laughs> that, you know, that, that way it's a lot, it doesn't shake off that way. What's something else you can think of we can pass along as a tip for using our, our nines? Well, I've had one patient say that it burned their fingertip, and um, I talked to Nonin about that, and they did a little research on that. And what the patient was actually feeling was not heat but the infrared um, on that. And what we discovered, it was too small. It, was, it pressed against the fingertip too hard. They come in three different sizes. I always use medium for everybody. But on this particular patient, I, I had to go to a large. Okay. And so that's, it, you should probably have each of those three sizes in your, in your cabinet there, but most of them would be medium. Right, right. It's like most everything else, right? There's always yeah. those outliers. Yeah. Yeah, so, I know. Tell me about the software a little bit because that is that pretty wow. easy and pretty intuitive? 
Yeah, they uh, when they first came out. Uh, when I first not when they came out, they've been on a long time. When I first got my first not, and uh, their software wasn't very good, and I had another type of software. Uh, mm -hmm. But when the 3150 came out, wow, they did an Envision software, which is just fantastic. I can I can um, change the machine settings with this software. I can go in, like I said, I want a 2% desaturation as my event um, standard. I can change the way it looks, um, and this I know they're even working on a web-based uh, application in the future, um, which will even be better yet. Um, it's again the assistants do it all, and I get I get a great readout. I like cool. it's very simple. Uh, it's not that difficult to teach when I teach dentists to use this. It's those three things I showed you on the webinar. Those are things I look at the most. And then there's more information there if you want more. And you mentioned you can set up for two percent DSAT. Well, you know, I know the guidelines are either three or four, depending on who you listen to. So you're you're trying to make yours even more sensitive, I guess. Yeah, because I do have patients who are upper airway, and they may go down two percent, which would pick up as zero on a sleep study. And so right. some dentists even use a one percent, and that's really sensitive. I don't I I I don't think I would do that. I would do two percent. Yeah. Yeah, because even the type three monitors we have, I don't know if I can reset my type three monitors that I have uh, to be that sensitive, and so that uh, the wrist ox gives us a little bit more of a ability to be uh, fine tuned with that. Particular type. I just can't tell you what it's like to have a device that's dependable and I can use over and over and over again. I don't have to worry about the cost to my practice or the decreasing the profit of my therapy because there is no cost in using this. And I'm getting the type of data I need to make critical clinical decisions as to how effective my therapy is. So well, that's I, really nice. Yeah, I don't know that we can say anything more exciting than that to be able yeah. to uh, to endorse, you know, being able uh, having to be this kind of a tool. To be you know, able to address um, our patients' concerns. Huh? I want to say something really quickly. Uh, um, I'm meeting with the president of the ASM this up the next meeting, and and we're going to talk about forming a committee to come up with clinical guidelines because right now there isn't much to say about pulse oximetry in any of the clinical guidelines for the ASM and ADSM, and so I'm going to be talking to him about doing that. And um, the guidelines I'm going to be pushing for are the guidelines that we had in this webinar. Um, I oh. think this is this is needed, and and um, hopefully this after next month meeting we can start getting something in writing for the profession to use. You know something you said I'd like to underline before we close here is that when we are using type three monitors in my area, the physicians are also using type three monitors because that's what the insurance is requiring their patients Correct. to do. Okay. And uh, so if I use a type three monitor, that does open up this communication sometimes, you know, difficulties with the patient's thing, well, why should you do it when i got to go to the sleep doc and do it? But the pulse oximeter is never threatening, is it? No. Yeah, because it doesn't take the place of anything that they're going to use, and so it doesn't look like the same thing, and it kind of keeps us in a good position. That's actually a good point. Thing. Yeah. Good point, because, you know, the physicians can use it to the type 3 to diagnose. Uh, we right. can't. We're not diagnosing this. Um, and so I don't have to worry about because you get these auto reports and you think, ha, structure sleep apnea. I'm going to go ahead and treat. I don't need a physician. Uh, no, that, that's you're actually breaking in Texas. You're breaking the state law by doing that. Uh -huh. So it's not something you want to do. I, I, I guess it's tempting to use these type three devices for diagnosis because the reports come back with the diagnosis. But um, I don't. I don't want to get into that. Yeah, that's probably a, 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 a remarks for another webinar, maybe, about how yeah. to use monitors in general. Anyway, right. thank you again, Dr. Friend, for uh, this excellent talk. I enjoyed chatting with you about all these things, too. And I, I know you and I think alike about how we should use uh, these high-quality devices in our practices. You can learn more about non and but we're using the URL that's going to be on the your chat box there. It's too long for me to say, so it's going to be put up on the chat box. and. We're going to make this webinar available to you. It's been recorded, and you'll be able to watch it over and over again. We'll send it to you on an email, and it'll be on the Dental Sleep Practices website as one of the histories. And I'm sure it's going to go down as one of our better webinars. So thanks a lot, Ron and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Prent, and have a good time. I look forward to seeing you at the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine meeting in Denver, where we'll be able to see this product and many other products uh, associated with high-quality treating of sleep apnea patients in our practices.
I thank you and the magazine and Nanan for um, bringing this information available to our profession. I really appreciate it. Indeed. And I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you.